After the Second World War, motorsport was nothing new. People started competing against each other as soon as first cars started to be made. But since then, the activity became much more organized and widespread. The human desire to zoom in a fast car is universal, so is that need for sport competition. However, the background for doing motorsport was not quite the same everywhere. So let's see how car racing worked in the communist Eastern Bloc's Central Europe. While I'm talking about that, let's go rebuild the very old and already decayed racing circuit in Altengrad. So bring it into the modern times, make it safer, better for racing, better for the audience. Let's go. We could talk about motorsport from various angles, but let's divide the topic into three main parts. So with what could drivers race, where and against who. In other words, vehicles, places, events. Let's start with vehicles, because that's probably the most interesting part anyway. The history of racing cars in the Eastern Bloc heavily ties to the overall car industry. And we have already covered that one, but just to summarize it quickly, car manufacturing had slow and reluctant restart after the Second World War, priority was in cargo vehicle manufacturing, and personal car was problematic ideologically. That quickly changed, and by the end of 1950s, productions took off. By 1970s, there were already quite a lot of cars in the region, many more in the westernmost parts of the Eastern Bloc, with decreasing numbers towards the east. Car manufacturing was nationalized and centralized, some factories were merged. This environment meant that companies only made vehicles based on tight central control. In practice, it resulted in limited numbers of domestic car models, and it was impossible for new companies to emerge or new car models to freely emerge. This clearly had negative consequences towards motorsport, but on the other hand, that is not to say that motorsport was banned or frowned upon by the ruling regimes. It's probably best to say the relationship was complicated and definitely changed over time. By the way, why are we even dragging the regimes into talking about motorsport? Isn't it something that people just do without including politics? Maybe, but not in centralized authoritarian countries. I could repeat that quote about baking bread from the last video. It fits perfectly into motorsport as well. So inevitably, the officials and politicians had a big say in this area too. And things would not happen without their approval. So on one hand, motorsport was amazing for the regimes, especially towards the rest of the world. It could showcase the technological level, help promote cars abroad, but it also worked back home. Racing events were a big social occasion, so could serve as diplomatic showcases. You know, basically the exact same reasons countries have for hosting today's sporting events. However, it all costs money making cars, building circuits, organizing events, and that's where motorsport in the Eastern Bloc hit a wall. It's always about money. But anyway, back to the cars. Fortunately, the racing world has so many categories and types of races that you can literally find a category for everything that moves. There were and are categories for mostly stock factory cars, divided into engine volume ranges, modified factory cars, purpose-built supercars, trucks, carts, motorcycles, and more. So let's start with a category where the Eastern Bloc did not exactly shine, since it had close to no vehicles for it. Road supercars, sports, sporty cars, or muscle cars, if you will. In the West, that would be all the Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Corvettes, Mustangs, that sort of thing. But it's not like the Eastern engineers did not try. Let's take a look at some very interesting examples of what did exist. In Poland, the manufacturer FSO was building the Sirena 100, a fairly ordinary car of the later 1950s. In 1960, though, engineers presented the prototype of a sport cabrio version, the Sirena Sport. It was apparently very well received by the public and potential manufacturers alike, However, the central planning did not count with it and, allegedly, its development was stopped directly by the highest government officials. The prototype was unfortunately destroyed in the 1970s. Despite its clearly sporty look and, well, the name, it wasn't particularly powerful and fast. Maybe for the 1960s it was. 
It did have a prototype, but still only 0.7 liter engine, similar to the factory Serena 100, which could produce around 35 horsepower, so more than the stock engine, but not quite amazing. In Czechoslovakia, a decade later, the production of the Škoda 110 started, and just like in Poland, Czechoslovak engineers wanted something a little sportier than that. The version 110R was designed, and it actually did enter series production, although there were only some 50,000 Rs made, compared to over a million ordinary 110s. And it had the same 1.1 liter 62 horsepower engine as the most powerful 110s. So sources do call the 110R a sports car, but uh, eh, nah, I don't know. However, engineers wanted to go even further, so they came up with the very interesting 110 Super Sport. Unfortunately, it fared similarly to the Polish Sirena Sport. It was critically very well received, but the domestic circumstances just did not favor it. It had the same 1.1 liter engine from the 110, although tuned for 104 horsepower and 211 km an hour top speed. Not bad for 1971. The only prototype was originally white, but was repainted black for a movie role. The vehicle survived, and you can go see it in Škoda Museum in Mladá Boleslav. I highly recommend it, it's a nice looking car. But now, moving on to a complete outlier of the Eastern Bloc, which could have been found in East Germany, the Melkus Company. Unlike FSO, Škoda and many others that were huge state-owned car manufacturers, Melkus was a tiny family-owned company, so just because of that, quite rare in the Eastern Bloc. The Melkus family was focused heavily on cars and made all kinds of homemade custom racing vehicles. The most famous was presented in 1961, the RS-1000, and unlike the previously mentioned prototypes, 101 were made in 10 years of production, and it was a proper road sports car as well, road legal. But just like the previous prototypes, the RS-1000 used parts from other series vehicles, this time mostly from the German Wartburg 353. So the same 1 liter engine, although tuned and upgraded for 68 horsepower and 165 km an hour top speed. From available pictures, the vehicle clearly participated in various races, so the Eastern Bloc did have a proper series production sports racing car after all. Nevertheless, it was a very rare exception. Just because I already mentioned Wartburg, let's also just lightly mention the very rare Wartburg 313 Sport. Quite similar vehicle to the Polish Sirena Sport, presented just a few years earlier in 1957. But this time it did enter series production, but with only 469 vehicles made. And just like before, the bodywork was mostly what made it sporty, as it used the same engine, 0.9 liter from its less sporty variant, although once again upgraded. There were some other sports and quotation marks sports models out there, but I think this introduction paints quite a sufficient image. Simply put, the political and economic environment did not favor road sports cars. Those that were made were mostly put together by a bunch of highly skilled enthusiasts with whatever parts were available, while overcoming obstacles of the environment. Proper research and development of supercars from the ground up was close to impossible. But that was just one piece of the overall motorsport puzzle. Let's now look elsewhere, although we will mostly see the same old names pop up. Logically, as there were just not that many car manufacturers around. What about purpose-built racing cars like Formulas, among others? Were those built in the Eastern Bloc too? Yes, yes they were. Probably the most famous series is the Formula 1, everyone knows that, but correct me if I'm wrong, there were no Eastern Bloc made vehicles for that one. However, there are many more series than just the one. For example, Formula 3, which in the 1960s saw vehicles made by Škoda or Melkus once again. However, they quickly started to fall behind their Western counterparts due to the lack of engine power, apparently. Melkus then also made vehicles for the Formula Junior, but probably the most important series would be the Formula Easter. Yes, it's actually called Easter, not Eastern. It was basically a series purely made for the Eastern Bloc and only Comic-Con parts could be used for the vehicles. No sources specifically mention it, but 
It's just a strange coincidence that Formula Easter was established with that rule and after it was clear that Eastern vehicles are not doing all that well with Western competition in F3. Nevertheless, many custom vehicles were made for Formula Easter. It had a 1.3 liter, 59 horsepower engine ceiling, so plenty of factory engines could compete there. This is a good time to introduce another very important name, the Czechoslovak company Metalex, or MTX today. Metalex was another small group of enthusiasts who managed to create a company under the state that was officially a metal treating factory, hence its name, and a repair shop. But clearly its intended purpose was to make custom racing cars. And racing cars they did. A lot of them, actually. 168 formulas alone since 1970 onward. But formulas were not made by companies only. Many smaller teams made their own homemade vehicles in garages or refurbished old ones and so on. It's kind of hard to imagine that today, especially for the higher series, but back in these times, that was the reality. Okay, so those were supercars and custom formulas. And now for racing series, where the Eastern Bloc's vehicles and teams were doing actually pretty well. That is rally and circuit racing of modified factory cars. Here the vehicle selection was much larger. Most of the factory-made cars had some sort of racing counterpart, although still with mostly stock low-volume engines, so only able to race in those lower-volume categories. Let's start in East Germany and with a vehicle that you would probably not associate with racing, Trabant. That's right, Trabant did compete, mostly in rally events. Well, not this one, but a specially made P800 RS version which received homologation for Group A rally in 1985 and it was apparently not a complete disaster in races. It was doing okay. Another very popular German car, already mentioned for donating parts to the Melkus supercar, was the Wartburg 353. It also received a special rally version, which was actually not that different from the stock version and it is mentioned that it could compete in the famous Group B rally. Although it does not appear in the Group B cars list, so I guess it was not homologated for it eventually. Moving on to Poland, uh, there is probably the most famous Polish racing car of the 1980s, the FSO Polonaise, and specifically its many sports variants like the 2000 rally. Polish car manufacturing heavily relied on Western technologies and licenses. The most famous example is the Polski Fiat, just because of its name. But the Polonaise was also a Fiat license with Fiat engines. The 2000 rally variant used the biggest 2-liter engine, which in stock version gave it 112 horsepower. Although the vehicle was apparently very heavy and lacked better brakes. Nevertheless, one source mentioned it was able to keep up with the Renault R5 Alpine during one Polish event. So just putting things into perspective if you know your cars. The 2000 was also homologated for the Group B. Other versions of the Polonaise included for example the 2500 with even more Western parts, engine from Lancia Stratos or Ferrari gearbox. The stock 2-liter engine variant was apparently quite rare in Poland, so it was somewhat of a struggle to make the 200 vehicles as per the Group B homologation rule. And even then the 2-liter models were mostly sold to the government officials. Moving on to Czechoslovakia. The most famous rally and circuit car was by far the late 1970s Škoda 130 RS. It was in many ways similar to the older 110R that I already mentioned, but this time it was a proper racing car, specifically built for event racing. So that alone is quite rare in the Eastern Bloc. The numbering here is a little confusing since the 130RS has nothing in common with the ordinary 130, which was actually built a decade later. The successor to the 130RS was the 130LR, which in this case actually is the racing variant of the Ordinary 130. The 130 LR is probably a little less famous, but it was the LR that was homologated for the famous Group B, since there were many LRs made, so it could have passed the 200 vehicles made requirement. This version was also apparently made for the government as a fast police interceptor. 
The 130, just like in 110, means the vehicles used 1.3 liter engines, but both RS and LR had customized ones, with up to 140 and 128 horsepower respectively. And then there were many, many other less known rally and circuit cars, both produced by the big players, factory cars basically, but also small ones like Melkus or Metalex. All right, and before moving on to circuits and events, let me also briefly mention other vehicles. There were of course motorcycles, those were quite popular for racing since motorcycles were in general popular in the Eastern Bloc, at least initially before cars really took off. But various motorcycle races continued, circuit events, dirt bikes or on motorcycle speedways. Another vehicle with which you can do motorsport is truck. Truck racing in the Eastern Bloc, depending on the event, started in the 1980s and really took off in the late 80s. This is actually a category where the Eastern Bloc's vehicles could really shine, due to the very strong tradition in truck manufacturing, paradoxically because of the heavy investments into cargo transport for industry. Here I will just mention the events together with vehicles, since it's clearly heavily interconnected. Probably the most famous event, at least from my point of view, is the Dakar Rally, back in the day actually going from Paris to Dakar. The first Eastern Bloc participant there in 1985 was a Czechoslovak team driving the Lias 155. This is Lias, the Czech truck manufacturer, don't confuse it with Lias, the Soviet bus manufacturer. I have to admit, I'm mentioning all of this since one of my family relatives was part of the Lias racing team. Uh, we had all kinds of little plastic models of the Lias trucks and merch, you would call it today at home. And as a kid, I was following the Dakar rally quite closely. Well, anyway, they didn't do very well in 1985, but they got third place in 87 and actually first place in series production trucks. In the same year, in 1987, the second place was earned by yet another Czechoslovak team driving the legendary Tatra 815, which then dominated the Dakar rally for the next decade, after which the Russian Kamas took over until today. But there were also other truck events, many other international, but also some domestic. For example, the Polish Yelch rally, where unsurprisingly the Yelch trucks competed. So this leads me to all the various racing events. There truly were a lot. I found many, many names, but I'm sure I barely scratched the surface. From Poland alone, there were rally events like Polski Fiat, Stomil, Krakowski or Wisla. In Czechoslovakia, rallies Škoda, Barum or Košice. Wartburg Rally in Germany or in Hungary, the Budapest Rally or Hungarian Rally Championship. Rally was just very popular around Central Europe. It kind of made sense since majority of the vehicles mentioned here were also made for rally, car manufacturers were not building road supercars, and the actual racing cars were not that crazy fast and powerful for proper big circuit racing anyway. So rally it is. That is not to say circuit racing was not done at all, it's just that rally was so much more, let's say, conveniently done, given the circumstances. It's no surprise that mostly the domestic vehicles were dominating the local rally events. The more prestigious ones had Western competitors in the usual cars of the era, depending on the category. It was possible for Eastern Bloc teams to buy Western cars, so those would also appear in races, but again, depending on the category. An important circuit racing event in the Eastern Bloc was the Cup of Peace and Friendship, it had two categories, the Formula Custom Cars in the Formula Easter requirements after it was created and later also Turing Cars, so those would be the factory produced cars. It was proposed by Poland and eventually it included Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania and the Soviet Union. What's funny is that if you paid attention to all the things before, all the puzzle pieces suddenly fit together. It's a small world after all. So who was initially dominating the formula category? East Germany, of course, with none other than Heinz Melkus as the driver. In the 1970s, it was then his son Uli in Melkus formulas and Czechoslovak drivers in the Metalex formulas. The Turing car category was of course dominated by Czechoslovakia and the Škoda 130 RS. 
Teams were not limited to their country's cars, though, and in the touring car category from around 1980, we start to mostly see the Soviet Zhiguli, thus 2101 and 2105, which kind of steers me to the Soviet Union, but don't worry, I'll get to it later. The dominance of mostly German and Czechoslovak teams was largely due to the domestic support. That is, of course, not downplaying the skills of drivers, but still, the material background is necessary. Perhaps it's no coincidence that it just so happens to be the two richest Eastern Bloc countries, so states could have given a little more towards motorsport. The existence of dedicated racing companies taking care of vehicles also played a huge role. This is why we haven't heard of Hungary yet in this video, as if it didn't exist in the motorsport world. It certainly did, and there is one big thing that Hungary managed, more on that later, though. But the lack of domestic Hungarian car production simply showed in motorsport as well. There of course were eager Hungarian drivers, but they had to rely on other countries' cars and, on the other hand, could not rely much on support back home. So the racing results reflected that. I already introduced with the Dakar Rally how Eastern Bloc's drivers could participate in Western events. But just to mention a few more with results. The Czechoslovak Škoda 130 RS drivers, for example, once won the Monaco's Rally Monte Carlo or scored 8th in Greek Acropoli Rally. Polish drivers on the FSO Polones 2000 Rally were 12th in Acropoli Rally, 29th in Finland's 1000 Lakes Rally or 25th in British RAC Rally. 10th place in Acropoli Rally was once taken by Germans with Wartburg 353 and second place for factory car on RAC Rally. So overall, the international results were not bad at all. And if you read all the nostalgic sources about these cars, then it might even give you the impression that these cars were basically the best in the world at the time. However, we have to be a little more critically realistic in here. Sure, the results were there, and they were huge achievements for the drivers and teams. No doubt about that whatsoever. But apart from some super rare exceptions, the Western racing was just very far ahead. The history of Eastern Bloc's motorsport shows us a couple of things. First, the huge dedication of racing enthusiasts to make things work. Without these people, who did not just go the extra mile, but extra 100 miles, racing would never happen. Sure, that was the case with Western racing too, you often find some big names around the early days, but by the 1970s or 80s, racing was already firmly rooted in the Western world, with many car companies being more focused on motorsport, with dedicated divisions, a lot more money, better technologies, and overall the environment was much more organized. That is quite clearly the reason why several racing events and series were created only for the Eastern Bloc's hardware, do not show the disparity too much for the domestic audience. There are also many stories from, for example, the Czechoslovak drivers from some Western events where they describe their Spartan conditions regarding material support, if they were able to attend those events at all, that is. But at least Czechoslovak drivers had okay official support back home. Anyways, let's now talk a little about places where racing took place. You can find a good number of permanent racing circuits today in the area of the former Eastern Bloc, but that was not the case back then. For example, East Germany did not have any proper closed permanent asphalt circuit. There is, for example, the Sachsen Ring near Chemnitz, which existed already before the Second World War, but most of the circuit was until 1990 still on an ordinary road, even going through some villages. Czechoslovakia opened its first permanent circuit in 1983 in Most. It's still there, in pretty much the same configuration, and it's quite popular. Second circuit near Brno opened in 1987, although here the situation was similar to Saxon Ring. Racing was done on nearby streets even before the Second World War already, but it was finally replaced by a permanent track later. Interestingly, the first permanent circuits in communist Central Europe opened in Poland. First, the Tor Poznań in 1977, followed in the same year by Tor Kielce, which is rather short, so it uses the nearby main road for the full circuit. But now we finally move to probably the most important circuit of the area, which is in Hungary. 
Interestingly, Hungarians raced also before the Second World War already through the streets of Budapest in the Nipliget Park, which actually looks surprisingly fitting for car racing if you look at it on Google Maps. Uh, races were also done at the Budapest airport, but quite obviously these were not ideal conditions. The Formula One series took great interest in also racing in the Eastern Bloc. Apparently a Soviet Union Grand Prix was pitched but wasn't approved. And through various friendships and politics it was decided that Hungary will be the place for it. Except Hungarians did not have a fitting circuit. So Hungarian leadership ordered the construction of a brand new circuit with top priority. Hungaroring, just outside of Budapest, was opened in 1986 and apparently it was the fastest built F1 circuit ever. The first F1 race behind the Iron Curtain took place there in the same year and it was a massive event, attracting viewers from all over the Eastern Bloc. Uh, just a little fun fact, I've read an article that showcased that F1 series was quite popular in the Eastern Bloc since people could follow it on TV. Niki Lauda, the F1 driver, very popular one of the time, apparently received one-sixth of his fan mail from Czechoslovakia alone. So that is that, cars, events, places. Let's now make just a quick look into the Soviet Union. This series is of course not focused on the Soviet Union, but still, we should probably mention it and its motorsport. In many ways it was just like in Central Europe, although with more emphasis on domestic hardware and events. I found that Soviets banned the use of non-Comicon parts in their racing vehicles in the 1950s, although I did not find if this ban lasted into the 80s. Maybe, possibly it did. In the 1950s there were some truly crazy racing cars and concepts, straight out of some fictional atom punk settings. Uh, just to name a few, the ZIS 112 from 1951 with 6 litre 8-cylinder 182 horsepower engine. Impressive, but the car also weighed around two and a half tons. It still managed to reach over 200 km an hour at top speed, which was the fastest vehicle at the time, but uh, due to its weight and structure it handled very poorly and could not compete very well. Another example from this time period can be the Moskvich G2, which used parts mostly from the ordinary road Moskvich, including its modest 1 and 1.3 liter engines. But it was also very light, with only around 600 kilos, so it was able to beat the ZIS-112 easily. Skipping ahead, there were also concepts for proper road sports cars, let's just name one, the Pangolina from 1982. This one is not actually a concept, but more of a DIY project of a Russian engineer and his hobby class, which is a similar story of other similar vehicles in the Soviet Union none would enter a series production. This supercar actually perfectly leads me to an actual 1970s Soviet racing car since it used the same engine, the Vaz 2101 and later 2103 and 05. In short, the famous Zhiguli family of cars. Their engines were quite popular even outside of Zhigulis. Engineers used them to build many custom sports cars around the Soviet Union and even outside of it, for example, the Metalex company used them for their custom cars. Especially then in the 1980s, the 2105 VFTS version from Vilnius with 1.6 liter engine was quite successful, dominating the local races and even achieving success abroad. It was the third Eastern Bloc car to ever be homologated for the famous Group B rally, together with Škoda 130LR and FSO Polones 2000 rally. It should be noted that it was mostly the Baltic republics and especially Estonia that appear in relation to motorsport of the Soviet Union. For example, the already mentioned Cup of Peace and Friendship, if it was won by a Soviet driver, more often than not it was an Estonian name. But anyway, I think this could be enough for the background of motorsport in the Eastern Bloc. Let's now see the racing circuit that is being refurbished here in the time lapse. The old circuit that we had here was literally nothing more than just a concrete road, although it was a proper circuit, so disconnected from the outside world, specifically built for racing. But it was kind of terrible for the audience, there was only the main area, but uh, there were not that many viewing places around the track itself, just like I'm building over here now. 
And it was also terrible for the drivers, of course. It lacked all the safety areas, and even racing on it was probably not all that great. Especially it would not be great with the modern vehicles. So the circuit definitely needed an upgrade if it was to continue doing its thing, serving its purpose. Now, I'm 100% sure that racing experts in the comments will find mistakes with this new layout as well, but it's definitely an improvement over the old one. So, you know, chill. Now, this new circuit, uh, I'm basically using the industry standard in City Skylines. I just downloaded Ronix's pack of networks for the racing circuit, so the surface itself, the asphalt road, and then all of the decorative networks around it, so the curbs, barriers, uh, some kind of markings and all of that. So, you know, eventually it's going to look pretty much exactly the same as any other City Skylines 1 circuit built by others, but... Uh, well, in real life, uh, you know, it's just a circuit as well, right? So it's just a road. Uh, sure, there can be some kind of details done differently, and that's, I guess, something that I'm trying to do over here. So, for example, or mostly with this main area near the pit lanes, and uh, just the layout and, I, I guess, the environment around it too. All right, so uh, at this point I was done. I was actually pretty quickly done with uh, the change in layout. I asked the community for, for some sort of layout ideas and I was actually pleasantly surprised that we had some, uh, some racing enthusiasts uh, in the community who helped me with the layout. So thank you guys so much. I was heavily inspired by, by your suggestions and uh, that's, that's why I was able to do this uh, rather quickly. Now, uh, then I'm also using Ronix's uh, these pit box buildings over here, uh, but again, I'm just trying to do something different with them. So I just used these uh, like two lanes of that and just end the buildings with like perpendicular, uh, perpendicular units and this office building on top. Uh, with these kinds of uh, details around, I was heavily inspired or I was just looking at Google Maps, mostly at Hungaro Ring but uh, also some other circuits, uh, mostly Most and Brno, that I showed earlier that we have seen in the introduction. Uh, obviously, I'm limited by the amount of buildings that I have and just details of the buildings and these kinds of things. So it's not exactly one-to-one -one copy. The layout is not, obviously. But, you know, just some inspirations were drawn from here and there. Uh, this particular parking lot behind the pit stops, actually, that's uh, directly copied from Brno, I believe. That's exactly how it is right there. Uh, the pit lanes, uh, you know, it's just a normal looking pit stop, pit lane, really. So mostly similar to uh, many, many different uh, racing circuits all around the planet. Now, one major difference that I did in this particular version now is uh, I just I just cleared a lot of trees from around the track and I included so many new of these uh, like viewing areas for people. I'm later going to put event generators there so there will actually be uh, pedestrians like city skylines pedestrians there just standing watching the races. Uh, unfortunately, there are not going to be like huge crowds, you know, like people right next to each other, but there will be some people here and there. So it's going to look a little more alive compared to the previous circuit. Now, also with the previous circuit, I did not have vehicles. I had to make that old time looking vehicles, uh, but uh, they were only just statically displayed in the pit lanes, right? Because I could not make them uh, move. I would have to make a completely custom vehicle, but you know, too much work for that. So for this one, I downloaded some racing vehicles, not exactly Eastern Blocks vehicles. So we are going to uh, just assume that there is some kind of international uh, East-West thing going on. On the, on the circuit right now, uh, maybe some kind of World Series something event. Uh, mostly with Western cars, I did not download any, any, of the, any of the Eastern Blocks cars for this purpose. Did not find any of, the, uh, any of the racing or sporty cars for that, but that's okay. You know, I'm not gonna be really zooming in that much so we can just assume that these cars are uh, something else than they actually are anyway. Now, I'm just going to detail this place also with some sort of uh, flags and banners and these kinds of things. For this purpose, I actually downloaded the uh, the German, the East German flag and uh, Romanian flag and Bulgarian flag as well. So I'm just going to be using the flags of the countries that participated in the cup of uh, peace and friendship that I was talking about earlier. Oh yeah, by the way, in the previous episode, uh, we obviously entered 1980s 
and I did not introduce all the new vehicles, but you can very clearly see them over here. So I downloaded, uh, for example, the Avia truck, I think in uh, three different versions as a fire truck and the uh, the open uh, back, you know, with some kind of crates. That's apparently a, tr a truck from Half-Life 2, if I'm not mistaken. Then I also downloaded the yellow uh, Tatra truck that I'm just placing around here. And I think I downloaded some buses. Uh, no, maybe I did not. But some personal cars I did. For example, the Škoda uh, Favorite, I think I downloaded. Uh, some of these cars are okay looking, some not exactly. So, you know, I'm definitely not using every single one from the 1980s uh, from the workshop, available from the workshop, trying to use uh, the better ones. And yeah, the racing cars, uh, those are some Western models. I believe one of them is the Lancia Stratos. The, the other two, I'm not exactly sure right now. Doesn't matter, like I said. All right, so uh, since I bothered with the vehicles, I obviously now need to make the circuit actually functional. Uh, many people have done that. Uh, you, can, you can find you know, many creators who did racing circuits. So obviously this must have been included in here as well. Now, there are probably many different uh, approaches, techniques on how to do this, but there is obviously that very practical problem how to actually make the vehicles work, you know, how to actually send them on the track, because it's not like there is a category for a racing car in City Skylines, right? So you have to make them a bus because you can then control them. I guess you could technically make them into a train and actually use like an invisible train track, Maybe, but it's probably the easiest to do it as a bus. So I converted those three racing cars into a bus version. And then I'm just using this invisible highway down below the actual track. I guess I could have also used the lane controller mod to actually make the, the, you know, the racing line on the track. But uh, I think this is actually easier. And it's going to allow me to do one little trick, and that is I need to double the invisible highway below the track so that I'm basically going to make like a spiral, okay? Yeah, so I'm going to achieve this. I'm going to make the stop inside the, the pit box and uh, then I obviously need to make it go so that at least on a single lap, it's going to go through the, through the finish lane or the finish straight, right? Uh, otherwise, it would be just going into the pit lane all the time. So. Uh, the car is going to leave the pit box, it's going to go to the first spiral on the track, then it's going to go to the finish straight where it's going to enter the second spiral and uh, that's going to lead back to the pit lane. I guess I could have made uh, a third one, fourth one, fifth one and uh, just make it go so that after all of these five laps really, they would enter the pit stop, right? Yeah, now that I talk about it, it kind of sounds logical. Maybe I should have done that. But, uh, you know, it becomes very difficult to put that together very quickly because uh, you have all these invisible roads right on top of each other. Yeah, that's not exactly all that easy to manage. So I guess that this is, this is as far as I'm willing to go. And yeah, it was working pretty well. I used uh, the original geometry around the hairpin there uh, on the top left corner here from this view. And you can actually see that uh, there on that left side, I kept some of that original track and basically turned it into like a service path, service road around just to keep some sort of original element from, um, from the original circuit, right? Um, I also did the sign there, Altingrad ring. That's looking really nice. That's a nice detail there. And uh, I kept this uh, like a tower at the start of the pit lane. Uh, I just wanted to keep the, the, these elements. I just wanted to keep the same. Yeah, so I did not even change much the geometry of roads entering the circuit and all these kinds of little detailed things uh, so that there is some continuity even though the circuit itself is like heavily different, right, compared to the old circuit. But, uh, well, it's definitely looking much better now. It's definitely looking so, so much better. I was intentionally using uh, networks to create those uh, safety, what is it called, runoff places after the curves, because networks are going to have that... Uh, like a, like a detailing on it, like a linear detailing that's going to make it look like it's been like raked or something, yeah? 
That's actually kind of common on racing circuits if they have sandy, these places. They might have it just asphalt, like Hungara Ring, for example. So that's what I did on the last and first corner. That's where I used asphalt, just to have it different in some places. I was also heavily playing with uh, elevation, with uh, various little details. There's, for example, this chicane, which has like bigger curbs around them, and all these, all these little things. This is one of those projects where it was it was just looking kind of weird and lame at first, but as soon as you start just adding those layers of details, it's going to start looking pretty good, right? Uh, I think that the most important single detail on this entire project are those uh, wear marks on on the asphalt track, right? So instead of actually using tire marks on the racing line, I did the opposite. I used like, uh, like uh, I don't know, like dirt marks uh, in places where cars usually don't go. Yeah, so that's all the all the wear decals in, for example, these places where it's uh, on the outer corner part. So it's looking a little brighter, and it's just it's just so much more important there. It's like a very very important detail. It's just adding something to the surface. Otherwise, it would be like a very boring. Uh, boring piece of uh, asphalt, nothing more. I really loved playing this, uh, playing with this, uh, like these views, right? I'm just using like a low FOV shot in that particular case, and uh, I was just trying to to do these kinds of views from like a I don't know photographer's perspective around these tracks. Uh, I really liked that. But anyway, that's the that's the racing circuit done. It's uh, I'm really satisfied with this project. It's looking thousand times better compared to the old circuit and uh, well it's there so guys that is going to be all for today's episode of Altengrad. in the next one we are going to build the nuclear power plant all right stay tuned for that so if you like this one please do all the things below the video clicking writing subscribing sharing and all that and big thanks to channel supporters channel members who decided to directly support this channel and me and what i'm doing here i greatly appreciate it guys again thank you goodbye